One of the great things about Python is the wide range of open source user developed libraries that can allow users to enhance the way they work with data as well as how they work with Python itself. Within the petrophysics and geoscience domains, there are a small number of libraries that have been developed to work with well log data. But first, we have to understand what well log measurements are. And well log measurements are electrical measurements that have been taken along the length of the well bore. And they can include measurements of the natural radioactivity of the formation, as well as interactions between electrical currents and the fluids contained within the formations. And from this data, we can infer a number of properties about the subsurface, including the porosity and permeability of the rock. And from that, we can understand the hydrocarbon potential of the formation, as well as the potential storage capacity for something such as carbon dioxide. The first step in working with well log data is to load it into a more convenient form to work with. This is where the Welly library comes in. It was developed by the Agile Geoscience Group to help with the loading, analyzing, and visualization of well log data. Additionally, the Welly library provides you with tools to analyze the data quality before carrying out any further interpretation. So this particular video is going to look at a small part of the Welly library, and that is working with a single well file or a single last file. And I will take you through the process of loading that data as well as analysing the metadata contained within the last file header and visualising that data. And we will also see how to carry out some basic QC checks using the well quality module of this library. So let's get started and hop over to our Jupyter Notebook and see how we can carry this out. So the first step that we will do in our Jupyter Notebook is import the libraries that we're going to use. And from the Welly library we're going to use two specific modules, well and curve. These allow us to load well data and interact with the curves contained within those wells. I am also importing matplotlib.pyplot as plt. There are multiple ways to load in data into Welly. One of the ways is loading straight from last files, or you can have a Lasio object that you've created using the Lasio library, which you can see in my first video on my channel. So here I'm using a well from the Dutch sector of the North Sea, and it's a publicly available data set that can be downloaded from nlog.nl. As with the example from Lasio, we can pass in a text string of where the data is located and the file name. Here we are currently returning an error at the moment because there are some irregular depths within this particular last file that have not been sorted out. That means that the file will be interpolated to a regular depth step. So let's begin exploring the data. And we can start with calling upon the well object. And when we do, we get information about the well. We get the well name at the top, we get the location of it, which is in the North Sea, and the country that the well belongs to, the Netherlands. And also, we can see that in the county field, sometimes what they do, certainly in the North Sea area, is instead of putting the county, which doesn't really exist in the North Sea, they put in the rig name. Then, in this file, we have the latitude and longitude of the well. And we can plot that on a map, but we'll see that in a later video. Then we have information about parameters within the well, the API, the Kelly Bushing, the TD. And down at the bottom, we can see the data that is contained within that file. In this case, we only have five logging curves. D rho, DT, GR, NFI, and rho B. So we can take a closer look at the well header by calling upon well.header. And we can get the well name and the UWI if that has been populated, which is not very common here in the North Sea. Then we have the field name, which is L5, and then we have the company name at the end. We can call upon the location information, again by calling upon well.location. And when we call upon the well.location, we can see where we have the location being in the North Sea, the country being Netherlands, and a number of other parameters, including the latitude and longitude. And this is returned in the form of a dictionary. And this can be a bit difficult to read, especially have you, if you have a large number of parameters within the location section of the file. So what we can do is we can simplify this down by t extracting the latitude and the longitude. First, we'll extract the latitude by calling lati, which is our variable that we're going to assign the latitude to. And we're going to call upon well.location.latitude. And same with longitude. And we'll call upon well dot location dot long. And then we can print latty and we can then print long. And there we have the extracted latitude and longitude value. And we can use those values to plot the data on a map. So let's explore some of the data. We know in the well header we can see that we had five curves. 
But if we are uncertain and don't want to count them individually or we have a large number of curves, we can call upon well dot count curves and in this case we will return 5. And this can be very handy especially if you have a large amount of curves present within your file. So now we know we have 5 curves within our file, but what are the names of these curves? Well we can call upon a function called get curve mnemonics and we can do that simply by calling upon the well object and then calling upon get curve mnemonics. And when we run that, we then get back our five logging curves that we have in here. We have GR, DT, row B, D row, and then phi. But what happens if we want to view some of the data? Well, we can call upon well.data, and we can return the first three values from each curve and the last three values from each curve. And we can see that we've got our five curves here, GR, DT, row B, D row, and then phi. And then over here we have the, n the numbers that are contained within each of those curves. In this instance we have nans or not a number or missing values within the upper parts of the gamma ray curve and indeed in both parts, uh, both the upper and lower parts of the other curves. But at the bottom part of the gamma ray curve we have some values of 104.08, 103.37 etc. If we want to view some statistics about those curves we can simply call upon well.data and in brackets we can pass in the curve name and we'll do gr for this one. And in the return table we can see that we have the curve name and the units that have been the curve has been measured in. We also have the depth range from 81 to 4879 and we have information about the date that the data was recorded and its description. We also have some key statistics and we can see that we have nearly 47,988 values and only 15 of them are missing. We then have the mean value and either side of that we have the minimum and the maximum value. And at the bottom of the table we have a different representation of the previous cell where we have the depth column and the values for those depths. And the next step is to check the data quality and this is an important part of the petrophysical workflow. The borehole environment can be a hostile place with high temperatures, high pressures, irregular borehole shapes, etc. All of which can impact the logging measurements. And this can result in numerous issues such as missing values, outliers, constant values and even erroneous values. And the Welly library comes with a number of quality control checks which allow us to check all of the data or specific curves for issues. And this can include checking for gaps or missing values checking if an entire curve is empty or not, and checking if the curve contains constant values and also making sure the units are as we expect. So to start with, we need to import the quality module from the Welly library. And we can do that just simply with this import statement and setting it as WQ. We then set up a dictionary of tests. And we can do this on all the curves where we specify the key as each, and that will be applied to every curve within the data set or we can spe specify specific curve names such as the GR or Rho B curve. And then within the values for each of these keys, we can then add in the tests that we're going to carry out on each of these curves. So we can call upon wq.no underscore flat, and that is going to look for uh, if any of the values are constant. Next, we're going to check if there are no gaps, and we're going to check that the curve is not empty. So for the gamma ray curve, we're going to check that all the values are positive, as that's what we would expect. And we're also going to check that all the values are between 0 and 250 API. We will then check the units to make sure that they're in API or GAPI. Similarly, with the row B curve, we're going to check if they're all positive and if the values are between 1.5 and 3 grams per cc. We will also check the, whether the units are equal to G backslash CC or G backslash cm cubed. So we can run that and then that dictionary has been created. To make a nice table of the test results we can then import the HTML module or the HTML function from the ipython.display module and then we create a data QC table and we can call upon a specific function within Welly or within the well object called QC underscore table underscore HTML. We then pass in the test dictionary that we've created above and we then call upon HTML and then we pass that table into the function. And when we run that, we get back a nice table 
where we have each of our curves and the number of tests that were passed or failed and we can also see an overall score which is based on the number of successful tests uh, completed out of the total available tests for each curve. We can see here we've got the gamma ray which is six out of six tests we applied to it. We applied three tests to all curves and then we applied three tests to just the gamma ray which gives us our six tests and all of these passed. All the values are positive, there's no flat values and they're all between 0 and 250 API. The units are also in either API or GAPI, but as we've seen earlier, they are in GAPI. The curve is not empty and there are no gaps, uh, so it is a complete logging curve. We then have the DT curve and we only applied these three tests here, no flat, no gaps and not empty. And we can see that all positive is greyed out, all between and check units is greyed out as well. And that indicates that no tests were run for these particular tests on that curve. But we can see that there are no flat values, so we've got a nice green value. And then the curve is not empty, but there are some gaps. So we would need to investigate that a little bit further. Similarly, with row B, we can see that we've got all positive values, as we would expect. There's no flat values, and the values are all between 1.5 and 3 grams per cc. But the check units has returned false. So we would have to investigate that further to see why those units are different. And in fact, we can put in an additional cell in here and call upon well.data and pass in row B. And we can see that the units are actually G slash C3. So slightly different to what we have here. All of these mean the same thing, grams per centimeter cubed. However, there's different ways of writing it. We can see that the curve is not empty and there are no gaps present within our curve. If we want to see how many NANs are present within each of our curves, we can set up a simple test to go through each of the curves and call upon fraction underscore not underscore NANs. And that's going to check what fraction of that data is not missing values or missing data. And then we repeat the same process as before. We create the QC table and pass it into the HTML function. And now we see that we've got a slightly different result compared to above. Whereas when we looked at DT, we saw that there were some gaps within the data, but the other curves showed that there were no gaps. However, we can see here that we've got a fraction of that are not NANs is 0.99 for our gamma ray, and for our DT is actually 0.45, and row B is even smaller at 0.04. So this can be a little bit tricky to read, so you can create a simple print function where we're going to check the curve and the percentage complete. And we're going to look, look through each of the keys and the values within that QC data dictionary. And we can see that we've got our gamma ray, which is 99.97% complete. And that is what we would expect, as gamma ray is usually the curve that extends the most within a well. We then have DT, row B, and D row, with decreasing percentages of completeness. And this is just down to where the data was logged from. So gamma ray is usually measured from the top of the well to the bottom of the well, as it has many uses, such as correlation between other wells and tying in measurements between runs. And the other measurements have only been recorded from certain points further down in the well. We can see that when we start viewing the plots. So let's set up some tracks. And so a track is an individual column within our plot, and we're going to pass in MD, which is our measure depth. We'll then pass in GR, or gamma ray, and then row B, N5, and DT. And then we call upon well, dot plot, and then we call tracks is equal to tracks. And what we get back is a simple log plot with our depth range on the, on the left hand side here, and then our individual logging measurements within each of these tracks or columns within the plot. And we can see, as we, would, as we expected, that gamma ray runs from the top of the well down to the bottom of the well, and our other measurements such as our bulk density and our neutron porosity start much, much further down. And this will cover the reservoir interval. And DT starts about halfway down the well. If we want to change the depth range of our plot, we can copy what we have above and put that into uh, the next cell. And then we can call upon plt.ylim and then we can specify a depth range. So I will say 5,000 to 3,000. And we can see that we've now zoomed into the log plot 
over a specific interval and we can see dt now runs from the top of the plot down to the bottom. And we can carry this on until we get down to the reservoir interval if we want to zoom in over a specific uh, depth range. And finally, one of the most common ways to work with data in Python is to use a pandas data frame. And this is a simple process of calling upon df is equal to well dot df and then we call upon df uh, again and we can see we've got our data converted into a pandas data frame in a very simple way. And this will allow us to carry out further analysis using many of the Python libraries that are available. If we want, we can call upon df.describe to view the statistics of each of the curves. And we can also call upon the info method as well to see how many non-null values are present within each of the columns. Compared to the previous method I've shown you where we can see the percentage of nulls, this returns the non-null count of the data. And there we have the basics of working with the Welly library. You can see how easy it is to go from a simple last file to viewing the metadata contained within that last file, as well as creating simple visualizations with very easy to use functions. There is more functionality within this library, and you can find a link in the description down below to go to the Agile Geoscience GitHub repository for this library. If you have enjoyed this content, be sure to hit that like button down below, and also, if you want to see more content from this channel, click on that subscribe button and hit that notification bell. If you want to see how to work with the raw LAS files using the library called LASIO, then check out this video here. Alternatively, if you want to see how to visualize well log data on a well log plot, you can check out this video down here. Thanks for watching, and until next time, bye for now.